I first want to thank you for inviting us uh, here today to learn about a project that we've worked on for over 20 years. Um, I don't think I can answer all your questions in this hour, but we're going to be available this afternoon. Uh, you'll find this is kind of a convoluted project. It, it has lots of twists and it has lots of turns. Ovine GM1 gangliosidosis, mad cows, and Huntington's disease. What do they all have in common? Um, the first part of the topic, ovine GM1 gangliosidosis, is actually what I did my PhD research on at Washington State University. So I'm a veterinarian from Kansas State, PhD Washington State, and Lo and behold, I got stuck doing a genetic disease project and of all things, sheep. I made two promises when I left veterinary school. One, I'd never set foot in another university. And two, I'd never touch a sheep as long as I lived. <laughs> God does have a sense of humor, so. I worked on a project involving sheep and a lysosomal storage disease, a genetic disease in which these animals accumulate vast quantities of this chemical, GM1 ganglioside. I'm sure none of you have ever heard of this little molecule, but it amazingly has a lot of different biologic functions. It's kind of a little bit of a skewed picture here, but so this half going this way is a lipid. So that's a fat. This half of the molecule going this way are all sugars. So it's a combination of sugars and fats. This little part right here embeds into the wall of a cell. All these little sugars stick on the outside. And that's what makes this a really unique molecule in that it is through these sugars that all its biologic activity takes place. Viruses bind to these sugars. Cholera toxin binds to these sugars. Uh, protein uh, phosphorylation processes happen by binding on these sugars. The, these little sugar molecules are phenomenally active in biologic processes. Um, what makes it a real challenge is it can't be synthesized. It can only be purified. It's a natural molecule. It has to be isolated from animal tissue. We can't manufacture it in the laboratory. The main reason we can't manufacture it is we can't figure out how to put all these sugars on in the right order. Um, these are what are called glycolipids, so sugar lipids. And it's really kind of a lipid biology, a pretty obscure field in science. So there's not a lot of people uh, working in these areas. Essentially, you know, what is a gangliocide? And nobody would be able to tell you. Has, had anybody ever heard of a gangliocide? All right, Heather, a few. All right. Those that raised your hand, there'll be a test a little bit later in the... But amazingly, because of this confirmation and the location of this molecule, it has a lot of biologic function. It interacts in providing neuroprotective properties. What it does in this neuroprotective role is it stabilizes, you know, that all those sugars and those lipids stabilize damaged cell membranes. So in, I'll show you here momentarily, uh, studies using GM1 gangliocide and spinal cord injury. You know, that's its mechanism, neuroprotective. Antioxidative properties stabilizes damaged neurons. Um, this bottom bullet, uh, cell membrane integrity and signaling. The signaling functions of GM1 gangliocide is where Huntington's disease comes into play. And I'll show you that here momentarily. 
So approximately 25, almost 30 years ago, so this is old science, a company called Fidia Pharmaceutical uh, from Italy started a whole re research platform based on the use of GM1 ganglioside to treat various neurologic disorders. It was at one time one of the most highly used and prescribed human drug in Europe. GM1 ganglioside was used for uh, primarily peripheral neuropathies. Uh, Fidia had a subsidiary in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown University. Uh, they were going big guns, producing a product which they trademarked. Cygen, which is monocyaloganglicide GM1. Uh, it was produced from slaughterhouse brain material from slaughter plants all over Europe. Uh, they have a whole variety of patent portfolios uh, from Alzheimer's to spinal cord injury to Parkinson's uh, and every manufacturing patent known to man. Matter of fact, GM1 ganglioside is saturated in patents. Uh, They've actually developed technology for derivatives of the original GM1 ganglioside that actually have more biologic activity. At one time, Fidia had a spinal cord injury clinical trial going on uh, by Dr. Fred Geisler. They had a Parkinson's clinical trial. These are all human phase two clinical trials. Uh, Parkinson's disease trial, stroke, Alzheimer's, and uh, coronary artery bypass. Uh, neurologic uh, deficits post-surgical and coronary artery bypass. Well, this is what happened. So basically, Fidia's GM1 ganglioside portfolio was based solely on bovine brain from slaughterhouses. And in the early 90s, when mad cow disease broke out in England and subsequently was diagnosed across Europe, they basically came to a screeching halt because all of a sudden, unknown raw material, slaughterhouse, you know, if you go buy a semi-load of brain from a slaughterhouse, it's pretty hard to say, you know, that brain came from cow, you know, yellow tag 714. So they lost basically their entire manufacturing capacity to produce GM1 ganglioside because of mad cow disease. Arguably, if mad cow disease had not been diagnosed in Europe, Fidia would have brought to market a treatment for Parkinson's, and ultimately it would be available for Huntington's disease today. They were that close when mad cow disease broke out. 20 years ago plus, um, I was working in a lab in Boston. I did most of my research actually in Boston. And we were following Fidia's work with great interest because they were developing GM1 ganglioside as a pharmaceutical treatment. And I was doing research on these silly mutant sheep that had a lot of GM1 ganglioside. And in the middle of the night, the gentleman I was working with from India and I were looking at our first data. And it had, I'll show you actually one of the slides here in a moment, but you know, these lambs had just massive amounts of GM1 ganglioside in their tissues. And we were joking, you know, wouldn't it be neat if we could develop these sheep to produce GM1 ganglioside? Well, like all weird ideas, it stuck in my mind and it started to fester and grow. And, and I went back to my room and called my wife and of course, to, make the, to understand the story, most of our premarital discussions on sheep concerned how many to raise. She wanted 1,000. I thought 10 was well, way plenty. <laughs> she, she had, you know, when, when we got married, I inherited 150 targi ewes and some guard dogs and horses. And 
just like, I still really, you know, I had these mutant sheep I had to take care of, but I'll be honest, you know, it, it didn't, I hadn't caught the, the disease. <laughs> and, and so I went that night and I called her and asked her how she'd feel about, you know, raising 10,000 sheep. And of course, like most wives, she asked me if I was in the bar <laughs> uh, calling. So back then, we basically developed this statement to develop a safe and plentiful source of a raw material to produce GM1 ganglicide. We could tell even then that Phidia's bovine source was going to go away and there wasn't going to be anything else and that the FDA would require a source verified raw material to produce it. And so why not capitalize on the fact that these sheep can produce massive quantities, 40 times normal levels of this chemical. So these animals, ovine GM1 gangliosidosis, uh, like all good genetics disease, all good genetic diseases started out in Suffolk. Um, <laughs> these animals are missing an enzyme, beta-galactosidase, that cuts off this terminal galactose sugar molecule. So basically these lambs are incapable of breaking down GM1 ganglioside. They produce it at normal rates, they just can't break it down. So it accumulates within the cell and these cells start swelling. Um, they are, it's, a, it's an autosomal recessive genetic disease. Uh, lambs are normal at birth and progress to end stage disease probably about five months of age. So this disease will kill these lambs. And basically at slaughter, five months of age is when we harvest, harvest tissues. This is a, a photomicrograph of, of cells in the brain. Um, all this white fluffy material in the cell is actually the GM1 ganglioside accumulating. These cells will swell uh, basically to where they take up the entire uh, brain tissue in time. This is actually some of the data we were looking at when we were sitting in a lab in Boston uh, two in the morning. These are, are gels and these big black blobs are the lipids. GM1 ganglioside actually is part of a family of ganglioides, and so you see here. Uh, so this is this is how much GM1 ganglioside they're actually born with. So these are lambs at one day of age. Here's a normal. This is these are the normal lambs. So you can see there's already probably a, you know, almost a tenfold increase even at birth. By the time you're out to five months of age, there's actually so much ganglioside presence you can't accurately quantitate it, uh, you know, with this with this method. Uh, we've worked with this for a number of years, as you can already begin to understand. Uh, initially, when Phidia. Uh, became unable to provide GM1 ganglioside. The, the researchers that had been involved in these projects started slowly gravitating to us. Uh, the first uh, work we did with, with spinal cord injury and Dr. Fred Geisler. But it's important to realize that with Phidia's demise due to risks associated with a natural produced GM1 ganglioside, pharmaceutical companies were not real anxious to jump right back into GM1 ganglioside just because some guy in South Dakota said he had some sheep that could produce it. There was a great fear over a natural produced product. Uh, we did eventually start working with a group uh, Jay Schneider had put together for Parkinson's disease. Um, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the 
money that supports the pharmaceutical industry is an extremely complex organization. Uh, amazingly, this will come as a great shock to everyone in this room, but pharmaceutical companies aren't necessarily interested in your health welfare. <laughs> I know, I know that's shocking. Uh, venture capital companies aren't necessarily interested in the public welfare either. Uh, as we learned, there apparently is some financial motivation behind both of these entities. Um, the Parkinson's group basically, uh, they, they had designs of taking and packaging our technology, our project, and selling it to the next highest bidder. We felt strongly that you know, this treatment needed to come to clinical trials and that we were not selling anything until clinical trials uh, started. And so basically we parted ways. Um, you know, the reality, Parkinson's, and we, I met a lot of Parkinson's patients, this, this is the only drug in Parkinson's clinical trial history that's actually been shown to modify clinical progression of Parkinson's disease. But the challenge, as you sheep, sheep producers should know, there's a million Parkinson's patients. And the best case scenario is we've got to raise probably one lamb per patient per year. So to jump from where we are to a million lambs is a, is a fairly substantial hurdle. So about the time the Parkinson's Venture Capital Group and I were having a fairly amicable divorce, uh, a lady, uh, Simona Scipione, and a group in Canada published a paper in the National uh, Proceedings of the Academy of Science, which is one of the most prestigious journals in the country, uh, on GM1 ganglioside inducing phosphorylation in mutant Huntington and restores normal motor behavior in Huntington disease mice. Long title, but basically what this investigator showed that is if you treat these transgenic mice with, Huntington, with Huntington's disease with GM1 ganglioside, and she was treating it directly into the brain. She could actually reverse the, the, the motor, the clinical signs of Huntington's disease. So these are mice that were gonna die six weeks of treatment, they're clinically normal. So this actually came out the week I was flying to meet with the Parkinson's people. And I, I knew then that we were supposed to be working on Huntington's disease. Huntington's, as Heather and Mike, it, it's a brutal disease. I really, I mean, I knew it was a genetic disease. I had this passing understanding of it, but I did not understand it at all in any detail. Uh, 30,000 people are symptomatic with Huntington's disease. 75,000 people are probably carrying the gene. Um, has a 10 to 15 years preclinical phase. Uh, cognitive motor uh, function. Uh, it's, it's amazing if you look, I don't have time to present a lot of the data on Huntington's, but you look at the brain even, in, even when they're clinically normal, the brain is slowly being destroyed in these patients. Um, you know, as Heather pointed out, the, the long-term care, uh, the decline, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a brutal disease. Uh, there's a juvenile form of Huntington's disease that affects younger patients, a uh, good friend of ours, good family. You know, their, their daughter's 23 years old, uh, suffering with juvenile Huntington's disease. She has a three-year-old daughter. 
you know, 50% at risk, then she won't make it probably another three or four years. Um, Huntington's disease, the pathology, is associated with accumulation of a protein, the Huntington protein. The Huntington protein has what's referred to as CAG repeats. So uh, uh, these are just uh, nucleic acid repeats on the end of the gene, uh, cysteine, adenine, guan uh, guanine, one right after the other. And the more repeats of that triplex, the more severe the disease is. Um, so treatments are designed and are being sought that somehow make this mutant protein go away. In Alzheimer's, the mutant protein's alpha beta amyloid. In Parkinson's, it's senilin. All these diseases are, have these commonalities of bad proteins accumulating. So what appears to happen in Huntington's disease with GM1 ganglioside is that Huntington's patients, for some reason, we don't totally understand it, are deficient in GM1 ganglioside. And if the GM1 ganglioside is replaced, this mutant Huntington protein can be broken down. It's a very simple method. Replace the GM1 ganglioside, break down the mutant protein. Uh, the actual mechanism itself is a little bit more complicated. But the reality is if you treat mice with Huntington's disease, and we've done this with our ovine product within actually as short as two weeks, the mutant Huntington protein is decreased by 50%, two weeks. So it's a, it's a, a, a direct action. Replace the GM1, break down the Huntington protein. Uh, the top gentleman, Dr. Stephen Hirsch, I could probably talk for hours on, on him. He, he's a leading researcher in Huntington's disease. He's at Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, Harvard Medical School. He runs a center of excellence for Huntington's disease. And he, and he, and he made the mistake of being trapped by me at a convention in Las Vegas. He sat behind a table at a booth that only had one exit. <laughs> uh, you know, so an hour later, you know, the poor guy gave me his actual business card, and and you know we had a back and forth because he was skeptical. You know, sheep ganglioside, it sounds a little far fetched, but it, to his credit, he did the first experiment, and and he demonstrated within. I mean, it was a crude experiment, so I don't think he believed it would work, but within two weeks of injecting GM1 ganglioside into the abdomen of these mice, he could decrease Huntington protein by 50%. Needless to say, I don't trap him behind tables anymore. He, he's been a really active and uh, valuable leader for this project. Ovine GM1 ganglioside is manufactured by a company in Alabama. We work with, we've worked with them for many years. Uh, Avanti Polar Lipids, uh, a gentleman named Dr. Walt Shaw, uh, just as an aside, he does not allow University of Alabama anything on his campus or on his building. The bad news is he's an Ohio State fan, but. Um, so Walt, Shaw and Avanti is also part of this team. Um, basically the take home message is that this is the Huntington protein level in a normal mouse. These are just normal laboratory mice. This is the Huntington level 
in a, in a Huntington mice that mouse that's going to die. So this is the Huntington levels after two weeks, two weeks of therapy. So we were able to bring it almost down to normal limits. This you know, was, I think it's, it's very, it's, it's actually mind-boggling data because the, the reality is we have a molecule here that has been demonstrated to be safe through use in thousands of humans and all of a sudden, you know, we can demonstrate this kind of a treatment effect. Um, the, the problem with GM1 ganglicide has always been delivery. The Italians, bless their heart, always took the easy way out. They threw phenomenal parties, but when it came to science, they always took compromise. So they developed a platform based on subcutaneous injection. When you inject GM1 ganglicide in the butt, it is a long way to the brain. <laughs> that being said, some people's butts are closer to the brains than others, but it's still a long way to the brain. So we have developed a different platform. We're developing an intranasal drug application, hopefully, and we've actually demonstrated that essentially the same results delivering the ganglicide intranasally. Um, ideally, delivering it directly to the brain is still the most uh, promising, especially for those patients where we need to reverse clinical signs. Dr. Hirsch, and he, and he knows what he's talking about. He said, you know, there's, there's a lot of extra problems and headaches that come with putting a catheter in people's brains and injecting a drug that way. But the reality is, is we may ultimately end up there for clinical patients. Um, Medtronix over in the cities produces a little pump. The GM1 ganglicide is delivered through a catheter to the middle of the brain. Patients probably wouldn't even know they're being treated. So, Is anybody sitting there asking why the heck hasn't this happened already yet? Well, I gave you several hints. This probably will come as a shock to you, but big pharma really doesn't like sheep. And even more importantly, big pharma doesn't particularly like sheep producers. They want projects that can be controlled from start to finish, if it can be synthesized in the laboratory on a stainless steel bench, that is what they're interested in. Venture capital companies who invest in these projects want intellectual property, they want patents. I've already told you that part of our problem is this is not new technology. GM1 ganglicide has been around for almost that's going on 30 years. So, the federal government has, has become our uh, focus on trying to get funding to push this forward, at least, at least in, in the clinical realm. An outfit called NIH NCATS, National Center for Advancement of Translational, Translational, Translation Science, has a program called Trend. And we applied to this organization, and it, it was an, a, a laborious process, uh, many steps of uh, review. And at the end of the day, uh, they said they loved the science. The science was very strong and compelling. But lo and behold, somebody had Googled the sheep industry. And it, <laughs> it must have found the slide Mike showed about lamb consumption. But basically, they had concluded that the U.S. sheep industry wasn't prepared to, there wasn't enough industry left to do this, is essentially what they told me. 
And I, and I, I was in this last conference uh, by speakerphone, and I told them, I said, never in the history of agriculture has there been a value-added opportunity that agriculture didn't respond. In my part of the world, $7 corn caused a lot of grass to get tore up. <laughs> but, you know, the perception was is that we could not raise enough animals. Um, we're going back to these people. We've actually got the paperwork again, and I think we have since, uh, we've accomplished things that will make it clear to them that that is not the case. Uh, we have cooperator flocks, uh, Mike and Heather, uh, we have, there's probably 14 or 15 of them. The challenge is keeping the cooperator, the sheep production in sync with the science. But we, we've got a good start on the sheep production. Uh, you know, we've got, finally we've been uh, recognized by the sheep industry. We just received a National Sheep Industry Improvement Award. Uh, I don't know if it's the first, but you know, the sheep industry felt at least compelled that this might be uh, useful to grow the industry that they you know, provided funds, and I don't know if it's happened before, but their funds are going straight to Massachusetts General Hospital. And we're talking funding basic research using ovine GM1 ganglioside for Huntington's disease. This is not your typical you know, new recipe for making chislic. So, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're excited about that recognition by the sheep industry. So the project has three components, sheep production expansion, ganglioside production, and pharmaceutical development clinical trials. In the sheep production, we, we've, Lord knows we've worked on it for a long time. We've worked on this for over 20 years and we've learned a lot and we've made a lot of mistakes. We have a genetic test available uh, for the cooperators, blood samples. We can tell the producers their status, whether the lamb is of the affected genotype or the carrier genotype or a normal genotype. Um, we have, as we've developed this project, focused on developing useful, what we think are useful animals. Uh, the goal was to provide genetics to cooperator producers, and in order to make that successful, we needed a variety of genetics that fit in with producers' own programs. Uh, we've, we, <laughs> I like to think we've contaminated almost every breed of sheep in America. Some of, some of the breeds probably weren't really that wise of choices, and I won't disparage any particular breeds, but if you catch me in private, I'll badmouth them. <laughs> um, I'm guessing somebody in the room noticed that it was mad cow disease that put Fiddy out of business, and we have a little thing lurking in the background called Scrapey. Pretty much all the genetic basis of all these foundation flocks are all export monitored, Scrapey free. The reality is we have been to the FDA, we've submitted what is referred to as a pre-investigational new drug application. And of course, one of the first questions that we wanted the FDA to answer was, Okay, there was this little mess up with cow brains. Can we use ovine GM1 ganglioidosis tissue sheep brains to replace that? And amazingly, they had no problem with what we have set up. You know, the animals in this system will be source verified, called an ear tag. Uh, Scrapey monitored uh, throughout the system. The advantages we have as sheep producers producing these animals is one, they're harvested at five months of age. 
which is essentially a negligible uh, risk for scraping. Uh, so we have, this, we have this dialogue going with FDA. We don't know exactly what the final program will look like. How many are, in, are enrolled in the scrapey program? The, the reality is if all of a sudden 50,000 sheep joined the export monitored scrapey program at the same time, uh, the USDA veterinary service would explode. There's no way they could deal with it. Uh, in our state, they barely can deal with our 500 head. So the, the reality is we'll have a, we'll have a, we'll have a dialogue. You know, the, the end result is worst case scenario, we can always test each lot of chemical for scrapie. Um, contract producer, networks, breeding stock, technical support. Uh, what we envision, and, and it'll be interesting to see if it happens, is picture a wagon wheel. And this could be regional, there could be, I mean, we may have very well the makings of a wagon wheel in Michigan. But a central receiving hub that services an area of producers who will deliver basically lambs to a central collecting point. Right now the model is that these lambs, these affected lambs, and my wife will show you some pictures in the next presentation, be collected at probably 60 days of age. So you deliver a lamb at 60 days of age uh, and are rewarded with a pretty sizable premium. Um, you know, this, is, this has never been done to my knowledge and I think it just absolutely drives investors nuts. They don't want to build a pharmaceutical uh, enterprise that, you know, no offense, has sheep producers involved, or actually anybody involved, to be honest. They, they, these guys are really tight. They, they want to control. Um, Ganglioside production occurs at Avanti. These, Avanti has been absolutely critical in this project. Uh, Avanti, Polar Lipids, Walter Shaw are the experts in the world in lipid production. They are basically solidly on board to do uh, the ganglioside project into clinical trials. Um, the clinical trials, Dr. Hirsch is spearheading these efforts. Uh, Huntington's disease is what is referred to as an orphan disease. And so there are advantages to an orphan disease. I tell my Parkinson's friends that the fastest route to a treatment for Parkinson's disease goes through Huntington's. I can get Huntington's approved much quicker than we can an application for Parkinson's. Uh, this strategic partner, that's kind of code for people with money. Um, this has been a little bit eye-opening to me, but it costs phenomenal amounts of money uh, to get these things done. GM1 ganglioside has been injected into thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, and yet because we're switching from a cow molecule to a sheep molecule, the molecule is the exact same. We have to redo all the safety data. And you know, the price tag is uh, $800,000, $750,000 to $800,000, and it takes like 60 days. That's almost as much as sheep producers make. <laughs> we have the raw material on hand. Um, we've worked at this for a long time. Luckily, GM1 ganglioside is a very stable molecule. So we have banks of frozen tissue uh, for ganglioside production. Um, 
take home messages. You know, it has been shown to be effective in animal models of Huntington's disease. I would add that it's already been in human clinical trials for Parkinson's. So I would argue that some of the unknowns have been taken out of the equation. Um, it can't be synthesized. That's, that's if, if GM1 ganglioside could be synthesized in the laboratory, this would already be done. It just can't be done effectively and in any quantity. Uh, clinical trials, uh, when would they start? You know, if you ask somebody that struggles with Huntington's, it's never soon enough. I've had Huntington's families call me monthly and ask what kind of progress you're making. And, you know, the, the sad answer is, you know, it's, you know, we keep going forward, but it's slow. Um, my wife will talk about a little group that's been formed by Huntington's families called the Shepherd's Gift. This could indeed be the first development of a, a which could be a significant pharmaceutical product driven by grassroots. The pharmaceutical companies will not embrace this because it has sheep and sheep producers and the venture capital people don't like it because it doesn't have a lot of patents. Um, you know, so what we are doing is, is, and you'll see the booth, there's a booth out there. It's a group formed by families. These are all families that are directly affected. And they're raising money to support research. Um, you know, Dr. Hirsch, is probably the best funded researcher in Huntington's disease. He's used to receiving, you know, multi-million dollar grants without ever blinking an eye. He writes a grant, it gets funded. Um, this hasn't been the case with this project. You know, the first grant we wrote was turned down because they didn't think we could raise sheep. The second grant we wrote it actually was a phenomenal grant, but it was triaged before it ever got out of the system. And, and we don't totally know, but we can speculate. There is a lot of money involved in pharmaceutical projects. Currently, there's a clinical trial for Huntington's on some really neat technology, gene silencing. They're going to shut off a gene by injecting little pieces of nucleic acid. The companies involved have hundreds of millions of dollars invested. Um, you know, we're maybe being a little bit conspiracy theorists, but, you know, it, 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 amazingly, our project got torpedoed without ever getting out of the, out of the, starting gate at the same time this clinical tri trial rolled out. So there's money, there's a lot of money, hundreds and millions and billions of dollars of money invested. You know, we're naive, you know, we've had attorneys tell us that we need to grow up and, and become serious and don't worry about the patients, this is all about money, you need to attract investors and, you know, if you can't promise them big revenues, you're never going to be successful. Well, we're sheep producers. And, you know, we, my wife will show you, you know, what we've been about, uh, the shepherd's gift. You know, they sent a check uh, to Dr. Hirsch and he was absolutely tickled. And, you know, it was, compared to what he's used to getting, it was, you know, it was a small sum, but he was tickled. Questions? Go ahead. From your pre-IMD meeting, uh, they weren't too concerned about your source material, if you could screen, which you are. 
what were their concerns? Usually they, they will make recommendations. What did they recommend besides the manufacturing side? Uh, the pre-IND document was actually, you know, you, you, you must be familiar with them. The way these processes work is you ask, and I'm, this is all new to me, you ask the agency. It's not like, you, it's like the agency, it sounds mysterious, but you ask them questions. And so the first question, essentially paraphrased, was is ovine GM1 ganglioside, or gangliosidosis GM1 ganglioside acceptable for the production? Da 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 da. And, you know, basically they said, uh, we agree with the following provisions. And of course, the following provisions are what you're really wanting. And, and we knew that. The following provisions with the sheep source was that. It was all, it's all intuitive stuff. You, gee, you need to collect the material, harvest the sheep in a inspectable facility. Well, we knew that. Uh, you know, it needs to be, uh, they really weren't actually even that picky about it. So you, at the end of the day, the concerns they raised were, just to be blunt, they had no concerns with the sheep. They wanted us to. They wanted to make sure the tissues were slaughtered in an inspected facility. They had some questions about manufacturing. You know, so if you're claiming a three-year stability, well, guess what? You got to do three years worth of stability data. So these were. At the end of the day, we were pleased because the. You know, there really wasn't any response from the FDA that said, you know, you guys are nuts. And so, you know, the take-home message was, okay, we're, we're, we're in good shape. The FDA didn't have any major, uh, major concerns. The raw material was our big concern. We did kind of get burned, and actually we, we knew we would get, I, I knew we would get burned. But Dr. Hirsch, bless his heart, there is an ocean of data on bovine GM1 all this human clinical trial data, all the safety data, manufacturing data. I mean, it's, you know, go type GM1 ganglioside into Medline. There is an ocean of data out there. So Dr. Hirsch, bless his heart, said, you know, let's just see if we can convince the FDA that we can use some of this data. And, you know, I guess your government tax dollars are hard at work because the FDA does know the difference between a cow and a sheep. <laughs> they said, no, that's a sheep. And these were cows. And so the, that creates the problem for us that we have to go back and redo the bovine data. The good news is it's a pretty well spelled out plan how to do it. The bad news is, is it all costs money. Yeah. Do you have an estimate of the capitalization required to take you through phase two? Uh, phase two capitalization. He's got those questions. Uh, what I can give you, phase two, when you go through phase two, phase two starts, if those of you that aren't familiar with the way clinical trials work, phase one, two, and three, um, Phase one is basically a human safety study. Phase two is when you actually go into probably a double blind, although in Huntington's disease, they rarely use blind, uh, blind studies. Um, I can tell you that we have put together the figures to go through phase one. And we're talking in that probably 1.5 to $2 million, depending on, um, and, and, and actually, it sounds like a lot of money, but actually $2 million in pharmaceuticals is chump change. Pharmaceutical companies have that in their coffee fund. So, you know, that two, Dr. Hirsch thinks $2 million will get us into, into phase one at Mass General. Um, phase two, you know, the, he, he's speculating it'll go up to probably you know, five million to seven million, depending on. The reality is we've got that safety piece. 
you know, the, there's GM1 ganglioside is not an old molecule. So you're talking safety is pretty well established. So manufacturing, you know, Avanti, it's the world's leading manufacturer. So we have these pieces, we have these pieces. You know, I think this is the year they're gonna fall in place. The Canadian researcher, Dr. Scipione, will be publishing uh, more data this year, uh, basically expanding her studies into the, she did her first paper in a single model of Huntington's disease, mice, mouse, mouse, mouse model. She's got evidently two more uh, mouse models of Huntington's that she's demonstrated the same reverse, reversal of clinical signs. Um, you know, the national, each, diseases have organizations. You have the American Cancer Association, you have the MS Association. Each disease has a honey, a, a, an association, Parkinson's. Huntington's is no different. Huntington's Disease Society of America. It's a, a, a tremendous organization, uh, especially with patient support. But their challenge is so very little of their money actually can go to research. And so they are, as they like to tell me, they're cheering for us on the sidelines. You know, they're really not much they can do. Um, Huntington's, like many diseases, are, are adopted by pharmaceutical companies. And there is a lot of money at play. Somebody back there, yes? What's the difference between Huntington and Lou Gehrig's disease? Lou Gehrig's is ALS. Um, I can't really go down the long list of differences. The main big difference is Huntington's, a lot of these share similar features, but Huntington's is purely a genetic disease. I kind of alluded to earlier that even in, in Alzheimer's and in Parkinson's and Huntington's, there's the, they're, they're called misfolded protein diseases. Something's accumulating that's causing the cells to die. And Huntington's is the Huntington protein. And you know, our strategy is to try to make that Huntington protein go away. And you know, we feel that you know, GM1 ganglicide's been demonstrated to do that. Yes? When you were talking about strategy and getting in issues and so going out to get a So the question was back to scraping. And this is actually, it, it is a complicated process and we won't know the final answer until we negotiate with FDA. FDA wants to know that we have in place provisions to deal with scraping. Uh, you know, we have, okay, you, it, those of you involved know that RR genetics at 171. Every, every ram, breeding ram is an RR at 171. So what we lay out to the FDA is a plan. And then we start this back and forth. The reality is the FDA would love every animal produced in this project to come from a scrape, export monitored, scrapey certified flock. The reality is the USDA would implode if someday there's a million lambs being produced in the scrapey program, they'd, they'd explode. They can't handle what they've got now. So, you know, the, the genetics, our flock is export monitored, 500 ewes. Uh, there's several other foundation flocks that are the same way. Uh, we sell only our, our rams that originate from those flocks. Uh, your point was at the end of the day. Now, this is at the absolute end of the day. We could test for prion protein. But we don't want to. But if we test for sheep prion, 
why couldn't the beef be as the man Calfrey on and sell the the beef again we decide cheaper because they're bigger brain. So okay, so the question was, why on earth did we scrap the bovine ganglia side because of BSE? In America. In anywhere. The reality is, is that the whole paranoia of unknown bad things was what scared the FDA. They wanted to know where the raw material came from. BSE was just the disease of the day. It could be, it'll be something else tomorrow. So they wanted the traceability, and that's what our system has is traceability. So, and the thing you might have missed is each one of these lambs has 40 times normal levels. We're talking probably 40 cow equivalents. So we can afford to keep track of the records. You know, one cow brain may give you 200 milligrams. We can get five grams out of one lamb. 5,000 milligrams versus 200 milligrams. Is the meat from the lamb sellable? The question is the meat from the lamb sellable to the public? The answer is no. Um, current regulations, anything that's showing neurologic signs, which these lambs will by the time we harvest, won't enter the food chain. The reality is, is that probably is not set in stone. You can petition the USDA and the FDA because basically what they are accumulating is a natural molecule. It's a lipid, it has some sugar on it. Um, there, there is absolutely nothing unsafe about the product, but about the carcass. Uh, I think in time, we could have those discussions with the USDA and FDA, but that's not our primary purpose. Right now, it's, you know, to be honest, I eat a lot of lamb. It's, I eat a lot of lamb. <laughs> and it's really, really good lamb. When, when he was talking about the ethnic market, you know, these are smaller carcasses. These lambs' mature weight when we harvest them are probably 90 pounds. They have just the right amount of, I mean, did I say these were really good? <laughs> I have cultivated a cult following of friends and neighbors, you know, because we have freezers. Of, it's too good to throw away. My wife will show you our facilities. We actually, we, meaning me, I butcher them. My wife comes out and helps wrap. And, but so it's, we did, I don't know, 150 lambs probably last year. I'm really good at it, getting, getting better at it. Don't like it. So, any other questions? Yes. Oh, whoops, got the people are raising hands. And, one more, all right. For a Huntington's patient, would this be a one-time treatment or is this ongoing? The question is, for a Huntington's patient, is this a treatment or a cure? Uh, this is strictly a treatment. Okay, but is it a one-time or would it be like? It would be a miracle if it was, but this is, is the, the analogy will be a lot like insulin for a diabetic. They need that GM1 ganglioside replaced in order to process that mutant protein. And GM1 ganglioside doesn't hang around. Uh, you inject it in the, you know, in, through the nose and most of it will be gone in 20 hours. <laughs> We're gonna have to cut. A, There's a chance to talk to me. With three something, that, yeah. And I'll be here all weekend. I, I, I appreciate everyone's attention. Thank you. Uh, most of the things my wife will say about me coming up aren't true. <laughs> Just uh, FYI. Okay. Thank you.